You've had a scan, but what does it mean? In this episode, I'll look to try and explain in simple language how to pull it all together. I believe we can prevent heart attack. We can put in place strategies to reduce risk. We can literally plan to change your future. I call it Healthy Heart Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Warwick Bishop. Welcome back to the Healthy Heart Network. Today, I'd like to talk about how we understand traditional risks and the risks that we see on imaging and how we bring those together. By now, you may have decided with the help of your doctor that a scan is appropriate for you and you may well have followed through and got some results. Well, the question then becomes, how do you use those results and how does that then define your management, your best management into the future? So most likely the scan will have come back with information that suggests you're at low risk based on the scan, intermediate, high or even very high risk. Now once we've got the scan information, the health of your arteries, this needs to be matched to your traditional risk factors, whether you have low risk traditional risk factors, intermediate, high or even very high. The way I'd like you to try and understand that is that there is a concept of environment of plaque formation and there are local factors that occur in the arteries and we may not necessarily understand them all. An example, a simple example I use with my patients is to say, imagine you built a steel house by the sea. The environment by the sea is one that will promote rust and destroy that steelwork. If you look at the steelwork and there's no rust in the steelwork at the moment, is that a guarantee that the environment won't have an effect over time? Also, if you do get rust in the steelwork, almost certainly it's in focal locations. It's in particular points of weakness like welds or joins. So it's very important that you understand that there is an environment where plaque or cholesterol can build up in your arteries, but there are also local factors. From the imaging, we'll find features that are low to high risk, but there'd be a threshold where we think the findings are bad enough that this person will benefit from preventative therapies. And exactly the same with traditional risk factors. Well, of course, if we have low traditional risk factors, no smoking, no blood pressure, etc., etc., and we have low risk findings on our scan, the answer is really easy. There's not much to do. Similarly, if we have high or very high risk features on our imaging, on our heart artery imaging findings, and we have high risk traditional risk factors, then the answer is easy as well. There's no question that that person needs therapy. But often there's a requirement to mix and match these traditional risk factors with what's going on in the artery. It's this situation that I tend to deal with on a daily basis and my approach is to discuss with the patient the information that we have but treat the weakest link as it is a break in the weakest link that will define this individual's outcome. The way I tend to think of it is in regard to this sort of matrix. Low risk, low risk, then it, it really is. There's not much to do. Intermediate risk, intermediate risk from the scan, traditional risks for, and scan risks. This allows us to be aware that this person may have problems down the line. It may allow us to advise weight loss, blood pressure therapy, cessation of smoking. But once we move into high and very high risk, regardless of whether it's high risk scanning, low risk traditional, my recommendation is that once you start hitting the pinks and the reds, this person will need therapy. It's very important you understand this balance between the high risk generated from either traditional or scan risk and matching that up with its counter. Often when I come through or go over this matrix with patients, I'll get a question from patients such as, how long do I need to take statins for, doc? Well, 
At this stage, once we've made a decision that someone's at high risk either from scan and traditional, or from either scan alone, then we will commence therapy to lower their risk into the future. And the answer to the questions for how long do I take statins is routinely for life because we don't have data that suggests you can take them for a short period of time and be cured forever. The other question I get asked is, why are we fussing about measuring all these levels? Well, the answer to that is that over the years with more and more data in the space about treatment of cholesterol and lowering cholesterol levels, every bit of data that we've had has demonstrated that for people who are truly at high risk, as we lower their cholesterol, we also lower their rate of event. Having talked about the risk matrix, I'd like to just mention two extremes. These are outliers really in terms of the normal population. And those two outliers represent two ends of the spectrum of calcium formation. We see people with low calcium scores, but very high risk plaque findings. Let's look at this. This is a low calcium score patient with a very dominant cholesterol plaque right at the beginning of a major artery running down the front of their heart. You can see how big that artery is. You can see that this narrowing is significant and you can see how big that plaque is. This had barely a speck of calcium associated with it. And it's really important to understand this group of patients are often defined by being younger, often having a family history. They can be pre-diabetics. If you look at their blood fats, they'll often have raised triglycerides, which are the free fats that transport fat around the body. And in fact, people with high triglycerides often have a bit of insulin resistance and are often more inclined to put on weight around their tummy. They may be diabetic, pre-diabetic, or have diabetes in the family. The other extreme that I think is interesting to at least be aware of is that we do come across people with very high scores. This is an image showing extensive calcification of the artery that runs down the front of the heart and the artery that runs around the back of the heart. When we measured this person's score, it was way over the 90th centile for age and sex. For these people, I certainly want to look at their cholesterol levels and check where they, are, where they are. I want to make sure they're not smoking. I want to check a particle called lipoprotein small a, which is a subfraction of the LDL cholesterol component. That's because LP or lipoprotein small a has been associated with increased calcification. I like to check their vitamin D levels because vitamin D is associated with calcium and bone metabolism. I like to check the thyroid function for these patients. And I also check a level of something called homocysteine, a product of metabolism, which is implicated in plaque formation. Lastly, I also like to check for markers of inflammation. So measure a thing called C-reactive protein. I use all that information to see if there's any explanation for this particular individual putting more calcium into their arteries than the average for their age and sex. There also happens to be a fair bit of data coming out now on supplementation or the role of vitamin K2, particularly in calcification of coronary arteries. I don't currently test routinely for that. And I'm not exactly sure where that space is going, but certainly interesting to read about and be aware of. So today we've talked about matching up what we see as traditional risks and matching up with what we see as the scan risk of the patient. If we get low risk and low risk, that's pretty straightforward. If we get high risk and high risk, that's pretty straightforward. At the end of the day, we want to treat the weakest link in the chain because this is the one that will come undone. Next, the scan result can inform more specific management for the patient with high traditional risks and low scan risks. It may allow us to vary or be aware of how we change therapy for that person. Three, there are two extremes of how plaque seems to form in the arteries. At one end of the spectrum, we have plaque form with small amounts of calcium, but a large amount of cholesterol. At the other end of the spectrum, we have brisk calcific response. Each of these are different to the average and each of these have their own unique characteristics. It is worth thinking about these and certainly both ends of the spectrum would raise flags for consideration of checking family as some of these features 
some of these attributes that can be associated run within families. Lastly, imaging can add information to help inform best management decisions for the individual, and that individual could be you. Use that information wisely. Your life could depend on it. Stay tuned, because coming up is Bob, a 67-year-old geologist. Hi, so hopefully you've now been well educated about what to do with the results of a heart scan, understanding exactly what it means. I'm going to now share with you this episode's case, which is a case about Bob. Bob's a 67 year old married man, married for the second time with two teenage kids, geologist who travels to remote places around the world, Peru, the Congo, Outback Australia. His interest is in fact in iron ore and copper mining. He came to see me because he was worried about being in far-flung places and having a problem with his heart. He's active. He has no family history of uh, premature coronary disease. He doesn't smoke uh, and his blood pressure was under control. His cholesterol profile or his uh, blood labs were a little bit untidy. His total cholesterol was around 250 milligrams per deciliter or that's 6.5 millimoles per litre. His triglycerides were also up a bit. The triglycerides are the free fats that can deposit around the tummy and also in the arteries. He was not on any regular medications. He had tried some medications in the past, but these had not been well tolerated. He really had no conviction to stay on them and he was not convinced that he needed them. However, we talked about imaging. We assessed his risk using a standard risk calculator and it was somewhere in the order of 10 to 15% risk of an event in the next 10 years, very much an intermediate risk category. I spoke with him about the pros and cons of imaging and he was happy to proceed. And this is what we found. I'm gonna show you how we can roll through these arteries in our reconstructs. It's an absolutely fantastic way to roll an artery around and have a look and see what's going on. I don't know if I have to show you, but I'll point out a couple of things. There's clearly some calcification up here, right at the very beginning of this artery. As we look further down the artery, we can tell that there's another spot of calcification as well, just in here. And associated with that is a fairly prominent cholesterol dominant plaque. This is a high risk plaque and certainly of its own would be something that we would couldn't be, be concerned about. And we would wanna reduce this gentleman's risk so that this plaque didn't cause him a problem in the future. He's now aware of his risk and so are we. We started to lower his cholesterol and we've got him on statin therapy. He's tolerating this without any problems. We've also got him on some aspirin. We're keeping a close eye on blood pressure, lifestyle, exercise. We're following his bloods regularly. We've put in place a strategy to reduce his risk into the future. He now continues to travel but this time he takes some medication with him. Stay tuned for our patient question section. Welcome back. In this patient question and answer segment, I'm gonna answer a question, can exercise be bad for you? Well, of course, we all know that exercise is fantastic and encouraged by major heart bodies all over the world. The American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week. That's roughly 30 minutes per day. And the nice thing is you can even break that down to 10 minute sessions if that works better for you. This information is freely available and broadly recognized. But I have been asked specifically, can I strain my heart by doing too much? Can I hurt it? Well, I think most cardiologists would agree that exercise is fantastic and we'd love you to go out and do what you can. And to a large degree, we love seeing people exercising and enjoying that for their heart health. But there are a couple of scenarios worth touching on. What I'd like to explain is that there are two main types of exercise. The exercise where the body moves fluidly, where the tension in the muscles is not super high, but there is lots of movement. We call this isotonic exercise. Iso meaning the same, tonic relating to tone. So the same tone, things like swimming, walking, running, they all fit in that category. 
There are situations when we exercise and the muscles are bound up tight and contracting firmly. They're not moving fluidly, they're stiff and hard and they're pulled together, bunched up. We call that isometric. You got it. So iso being the same and metric pertaining to length. length. So it's not moving, it's staying the same. So isometric exercise is the sort of exercise like lifting weights, really heavy weights. So now we understand isometric and isotonic and you can actually do some damage to your heart with either of those extremes. Let's start with isometric. Lifting heavy weights we know can put significant strain on the body and significantly increase your blood pressure. If you're doing that over and over, then you're increasing the shear stress in the blood vessel walls. The sort of stress that comes from blood rushing through blood vessels. You're increasing the stress on the major arteries every time you're lifting these heavy weights. There are, so there is a real possibility that shear stress could cause wear and tear in the arteries. Arteries to the neck, to the heart, and even the main artery in their body, the aorta, can all suffer that increased blood pressure. The other thing that's worth remembering is that lifting those heavy weights, putting up the blood pressure, puts strain on the heart. And the heart can respond by thickening up. The heart can actually thicken up like the muscles of your arms in response to that extra work. Now, big biceps down the beach may be good in a singlet and good for the girls, but it's not good for your heart. Now, a thickened heart muscle is called left ventricular hypertrophy. The left side, or the main pumping chamber of the heart, thickens up. This can be a consequence of elevated blood pressure. Now, that could be possibly from doing too much weightlifting. So, exercise that's exercise in that isometric straining type could put up the blood pressure over and over and then put strain on the heart and be problematic. Also, if you had a leaky valve of the heart, then increased pressure in the system could mean more strain on that leaky valve, more wear and tear, and, in, and inevitably a potential problem. At the other end of the spectrum is isotonic exercise, which is normally fantastic for you, but occasionally we see endurance athletes who are doing so much training that their heart can be damaged as well. We know that some super elite athletes who are training for hours and hours every day get changes to their heart secondary to that prolonged and excessive training. So there are documented cases of very high ranked endurance athletes who have problems with their hearts because the heart dilates as part of the long term training regime which leads to increased cardiac output and increased blood flow back through the heart and through the body. The heart accommodates but it doesn't always do it healthily. And occasionally these athletes at the extremes of exercise can have real problems with their hearts. Well, can you put too much strain on your heart through exercise? The answer is yes, at the extremes you can. And so you really do need to be careful. But all the stuff in between, particularly the isotonic exercises that we would love people to do, plus some sensible isometric exercise to keep the central core muscles stable is just fantastic. That concludes this episode. Thank you for joining me and I hope you feel educated and informed and you're looking forward to our next life or death episode. Until next time, please don't have a heart attack. Want to know more? Grab a copy of my number one best-selling book, Know Your Real Risk of Heart Attack. It's available as a hardcover or a paperback and an audio from Amazon or wherever good books are sold.